Come on, church, how we doing this morning? 10.30 service. I think we can do a little bit better than that. Come on, can we make some noise for Jesus? There we go, amen. So, like Pastor Daniel said, my name is Johnny Luvender, and that is my lovely wife who was singing, and she is my favorite worship leader. And I don't have to lie about it. It's a pretty good feeling. She's incredibly anointed. Man, we're super excited just for what God's doing. We just finished our series, Momentum. Pastor Daniel preached on a message. God did it last week. Come on, who loved that word? And I believe today the scripture, we're gonna be in Acts 16. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. We're gonna be in Acts 16. I believe this is another God did it story. It's gonna build your faith. Who here brought their Bible, physical Bible? All you guys are going to heaven. The rest of us, I got an iPad, amen? It's all right. Here we go. We're gonna be in verse 25 and 26. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, somebody say suddenly. Suddenly. There was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. I wanna preach to you guys from this idea, divine interruption. Divine interruption, let's pray. Jesus, help us see the interruptions in our life. Help us see them as you would like us to see them. Help us see your hand in the interruptions. We need a revelation of who you are and what you're doing. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Okay, so I have to confess something to you guys. Um, I really struggle with interruptions. Anyone struggle with interruptions? Like just you do not like to be interrupted. I really struggle with them. Um, In particular, I remember the time growing up where uh, YouTube didn't have advertisements. Anyone remember that time? I was probably nine years old. But I remember, it was the glory days. You could just watch a video all the way through without being interrupted. It's become a pet peeve of mine because I'm a recovering interrupter in conversation. It's become a pet peeve of mine, people who interrupt in conversations. And everyone, every family has an interrupter in their household. If you don't know who it is, it's you. you. I'm here to save all of our thanksgivings. In Jesus' name, you're the interrupter. So I've had to work on my self-awareness a lot, really a lot, uh, so I wouldn't be an interrupter. But now what I love to do, if someone interrupts somebody, is I wait for them to finish, and then I go to the person who was interrupted, and I go, as you were saying, (laughs) solid eye contact, just so they know how I feel. And I really do not like interruptions, not just in conversations, but in my life. Like, I love to plan things and do them. I love consistency, I love routine. So one day, we planned a trip with our youth interns to Slitterbond in New Braunfels, right? Number one water park in the world. So I have a morning routine, I get up, I go to my espresso machine that my wife bought but I use more than her and begin to make my coffee, I get my coffee, I'm ready to roll, okay? I go, babe, I'm gonna go to the car Pull it up so while you're packing the bags, it'll be all ready to go. We're gonna be on time. It's gonna be good. So I drive a massive truck, like this huge red Toyota Prius. <clears throat> and I go to climb in with my step stool, push the start, leather interior, handy down from my stepmom. I bet all y'all wish you had a hybrid now. Here I am. I go to reverse. I'm being a good husband. Within one second, I hear the loudest noise I've heard in my entire life. It could have been the trumpet sound, but it wasn't. And within a couple more seconds, I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounds like a motorcycle. And then my mind goes, did I just hit somebody in my apartment parking lot on a motorcycle at 7 a.m.? Because the priests don't make that noise. I get out of my car. I go to look and I'm expecting to see a gentleman struggling, revving his engine. 
But no, the sound's coming from my car. My sweet red ninja is now sounding like a Harley Davidson. And I realized over a couple days, I got robbed. Someone stole my catalytic converter. Anyone else that we're gonna pray at the end and you can bring them forward if you have one. <sighs> Obviously I'm bothered. An interruption, I was planning on going to Slitterbond, interruption, an interruption. In that moment, I believe the Holy Spirit just reminded me of a principle that I know to be true, is that broken things draw attention to themselves. Broken things draw attention to themselves. So do broken people. So does a broken generation. They draw attention to themselves. There's a amazing survey done by One Hope. It's an organization. And they did a global survey on teens. It was a global survey. And they really measured a whole bunch of different items. One thing that they measured was how much a teen is online. And they actually put it at seven hours a day. Now I'm like, that's an understatement. Some of y'all know you got that 16 hour screen time. Let's be honest. They measured a lot of other things. One of them was a focus on mental health. Now almost half of all the teens that they surveyed, 45% of them, one, two, one of every two in the past three months before they completed the survey struggled with depression. Now more than half of them, 55% of them struggled with high anxiety. And then this is the one that gets me personally. 25% of them, one in every four, one, two, three, four, struggle with suicidal thoughts and ideation. A broken generation draws attention to itself. It needs help. Now, there is some silver lining in this. I do believe that there's hope because of the teens that they surveyed globally, 40% profess to be Christian. Now of that 40%, they determined 7% of them were actually committed Christians through some behaviors and beliefs. And the bar was pretty low, to be honest. It was like reading your Bible at least once a week, praying at least once a week. And then some other beliefs that they believed about the church and Jesus. Now these, this 7% compared to the 100%, really compared to the 40% of other Christians, they scored significantly lower in every at-risk behavior and mental health issue that they measured, nearly every single item that they measured. Why? Because a biblical worldview is the source of our life. John 1, Jesus is the word. John 10, 10, he is the life and the life to the full. If you want access to that life, it's through a biblical worldview, not just reading the words on the page, but allowing the principles to speak to you, begin to shape your life praying, reading your Bible, spending time in God's presence. They scored significantly lower, less depression, less anxiety, less suicidal ideation. Why? Because a biblical worldview is the source of life. That's why I'm thankful for our pastors who do an incredible job leading this church. But not only that, they believe in resource and invest in the next generation because if there's ever a time where a broken generation needs help, yeah. one in every four, they encourage us, they lift up our arms, not just investing in Sydney and I, which I'm so grateful and incredibly honored just to be on your staff, but they are believing in the next generation, creating a space for kids and for youth and young adults to come together and allow a biblical worldview to shape their life. Now maybe, you're like, yeah, well, that's just the alphas and the Zs. That's not us. It's easy being an older generation to step back and say, yeah, that's, that's just not us, though. That's not our reality. But I would like to challenge that because I think since Genesis, since Adam and Eve, there's been an attack on all of ours attention. There's been an attack on our attention. What did the serpent say to Eve? Did God really say that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? 
It was an attack on God's character, who he was, and the word that he spoke. Your attention. So it's not just Gen Z that has problem with attention. The enemy's after all of our worship. All of our attention. Now what is worship? Worship simply is a total thing in your life that has the most of your attention. It's what's on the throne of your heart. That's, where, that's really what worship is. What has your total attention? What are you worshiping? Your total and utmost attention. Now Jesus teaches on worship in John 4, 24. He says, God is spirit and the true worshipers will worship in the spirit and in truth. And I love this word for worship. In the Bible, it literally means to fall prostrate. It's used 60 times in the New Testament to literally fall on the ground and even actually kiss the ground. Some of you are like, I'm, hey, I'm never gonna kiss anything on the ground. I feel you. But here's the reality. All of us worship something. It just might not be God. Because of sin, it's been the battle since the beginning. The enemy stole God's worship and that battle was really quick as he fell from heaven like lightning. But it was a worship issue. It was a problem of attention. And all of us have something that we're worshiping, whether it's yourself, your job, your image. What is it? What has the most of your attention? And maybe it's a plurality of things, but just not Jesus. What is it? What are you worshiping? Now, why does the enemy love interruptions? Because that's the very thing that gets our attention off of God. If he can just bring an interruption into your life, oh my gosh, we're doomed. He's after you through interruptions. In the interruptions are when your attention can be tempted to be taken off of God. It's in the interruptions. Because if he can interrupt your worship, he can begin to disrupt your life. If he can interrupt your engagement with God's word, He's breaking the source of your life. If he can begin to interrupt your prayer and your worship, he can begin to disrupt your life, whether it's a flat tire, stolen catalytic converter. <clears throat> Maybe it's anxiety. It's restlessness. Can't sleep. Can't sleep. Maybe it's depression. No reason to get out of bed. Could have been a divorce. It could have been an event. It could have been something traumatic. It could have been what was done to you, what was taken from you. Interruption. The enemy loves those moments. Because in those moments, that's when he can begin to disrupt our worship. Now, if there's anyone in the Bible who is very well acquainted with interruptions, thank God for the Apostle Paul. He was saved in an interruption. Acts 9 on the road to Damascus to kill and persecute Christians. God shows up, a divine interruption. A light from heaven flashes around him. Jesus himself confronts him and says, hey, you're gonna be my servant. Goes from a murderer to a leader in the church. One of the most impactful men in history, let alone Christian history. Writes over half of the New Testament, Paul, a divine interruption. Then you get to chapter 16, where we are today. Oh my gosh, I, I love that this is in the Bible. It says that Paul and his companions were starting their second missionary journey. They set out. They tried to preach the gospel in Asia. And it literally says, the Holy Spirit blocks them like a divine, holy, stiff arm. Just, <laughs> I'm excited for football. <laughs> the Holy Spirit blocks them and prevents them from preaching the gospel. So then, Interruption. Has to go hundreds of miles the other way. They end up in a city called Philippi. The first European city in their journey. They begin to preach the gospel. A woman, Lydia, who was rich, rich, got saved. How do we know she's rich? She could house all of them. Paul and all of his companions gave him a place to stay. Then one day, while they're still in Philippi, preaching the gospel, on their way to a place of prayer, a slave woman comes and approaches Paul. And this woman is antagonizing and shouting and screaming for many days. 
Not just one day, not just two days, but many days. Screaming, these are servants of the Most High God. They know the way to be saved. They're telling us the way to be saved. These are the servants of the Most High God. They know the way to salvation. Telling the truth, but twisting it in a way that didn't benefit the gospel, which that was the spirit that she had. The spirit gave her the ability to tell the future. She was a fortune teller and she was a slave. So she had masters. Now here she is interrupting Paul. Paul gets so annoyed. What you have to catch here is this word for annoyed in the way we understand it is a little bit of, a, of an understatement. The word that was used really genuinely means to be fatigued, piercely fatigued, like totally troubled, like worn out, like I can't do this anymore. And when he's annoyed, he rebukes the spirit in the woman and the spirit leaves. Maybe that's what you're going through. Maybe the interruptions in your life have just worn you down. Maybe the interruptions that have happened, you're just worn out. It's wearing you down. There was COVID and then a relationship and then unmet expectation and then your job and then your boss and then what's next? The priest. But you're worn down. Paul rebukes the spirit in that moment. The spirit leaves. And then the masters, they're like, oh no, that's how we made money. They come and drag Paul and Silas, interruption, drag them all the way to the marketplace in front of the leaders of the city. A crowd begins to build and they're accused. These men, they're teaching their Jewish customs and they're throwing our city into an uproar. They're being accused of being an interruption, labeled an interruption. Maybe that's what you walk with every room you walk into. I'm just an interruption. I'm, I'm, I'm just in the way. I'm just an in, in inconvenience. Just, I just feel space. I don't mean to intrude. I don't mean to be here. I just want to be in the back today. Maybe that's a label on your life. An interruption. Now here Paul is in front of the rulers of the city labeled an, in, an interrupter. And then the rulers of the city go, okay, this sounds good. We are going to publicly beat them with rods and then throw them into prison. So now they're publicly beaten by the crowd, whipped and stripped, hit by rods in front of the whole city and then dragged to prison. Interruption after interruption. And that's where we pick up in verse 25. Let's read it. At about midnight, the literal darkest hour, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. How were they worshiping? Why were they worshiping? I thought that Paul was stiff-armed by God. I, I thought that Paul was interrupted by the slave woman and antagonized until he was fatigued. I thought that Paul was just whipped. I thought that Paul is now in the inner cell the scripture says it's the inner cell. It's literally where you put the dragon. It's the darkest place. You don't want anything in there to come out. Here Paul is worshiping. How was he worshiping? This is what I want to submit to you today. Paul had a way that he saw God that enabled him to worship. His revelation determined how he responded to interruptions. Your revelation of God, how you see God, will determine how you respond to interruptions. Because I don't know about you, I wanna see God the way Paul sees God. What did Paul have? He knew that he was the God whose kindness leads us to repentance. The God who can take us from a murderer to a leader. The God who does everything for the good of those who love him. That God. We see the revelation. God, I wanna see God how Paul does. What does he see? Kind father loves you, It's gracious, exactly what you didn't have. He is all of those things. The remedy to your soul, all the distress, 
than Jesus. Paul could see that. What I love about this story is it wasn't just for Paul and Silas because the earthquake happens. What happens? They get set free. But it says the other prisoners were listening. They were listening. And it's not just Paul and Silas. God isn't just coming for Paul and Silas. He came for the whole prison. And the whole prison got set free. How would you worship if on the other side of your worship, someone in your workplace could find freedom? How would you worship if someone in your family could find freedom on the other side of your worship? How would you worship? What if you knew that the moment in your interruption, you could turn to God and God would show up, not just for you, but he's coming after your family. He's coming after your workplace, wherever you are. Worship changes an atmosphere. Prayer is powerful. Don't let the interruptions disrupt your worship. Don't let the interruptions stop your worship. I'm a product of my grandma, Pat, who in all the interruptions of my life kept praying. In what looks like a pit in a prison, in my family, through the divorce, through the darkness, through the cops showing up at the door, she kept praying. She might not have been able to trace God, but she persevered in the pain. She kept praying. In the darkest hour, she was still praying. Don't stop your worship. Come on, can we thank God for the saints who kept praying? We are a product. Every generation since Paul, saints have persevered in the pain. Persevered in the pain. So here's my question to you today. What have you written off as a trial, as a suffering, as an inconvenience, as a hardship? What did you lose hope in? What have you given up on? I believe God is speaking to people today, rewriting the narrative of their interruptions. That, that's not just an inconvenience, but that's my divine hand in your life. But you just gotta see it. You just gotta see me through it. What in your life is it that God is saying, that's my hand? Although it's hard, although it hurts, I'm gonna use this for my glory. I'm gonna use this to restore generations. I'm gonna use this to restore your family. I'm gonna use this to set you up as a light. Like a city on a hill, you're gonna be a witness because your worship is now gonna become a witness to my greatness, for my glory, for my namesake. I'm gonna come and rescue you. What have you written off? That's really just God's hand. Because the jailer, same event, same event, divine earthquake, God's hand, everyone's set free. Paul and Silas, they're probably like, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And then they walk out. The jailer wakes up. That's what the scripture says. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The Holy Spirit spoke so strongly to me. What can we do for the next generation? What can we do for the people in our family? What can we do for the people in our workplace? What can we do? Paul, who was labeled as an interruption, became the jailer's interruption. Yeah. Don't harm yourself. I'm here. Don't go through with it. We love you. God's got a plan for you. Come with me to church. Don't give up. God's not done. God's not done with you. We can be the divine interruption. That's why we have Next Gen Ministries. That's why we do kids, that's why we do youth, that's why we're beginning young adults. So that the next generation can have a space where people can stand in the gap like Paul and say, hey, I know it's one in four. I know one in four of you are thinking it, but I'm here, I'm gonna step in, I'm gonna serve, I'm gonna show you in my action and my worship, and my prayer, that I love you. That's why we're launching connect groups, because you need people in your life close enough to you to know your pain, 
but bold enough to pull you out of the pit, to set you free from your prison. The way the story ends, the jailer calls for the lights, he rushes in, he fell trembling before Paul and Silas. So the jailer, because he failed his profession, his one job was to keep everyone in chains in the prison. This is one job. He fails, he knows the consequences of his failure. Everyone's set free. These are harsh rulers, there's no excuse. I'm either facing execution or imprisonment. He decides, you know what, I'm gonna take my life on my own hands. Paul interrupts him. So the jailer comes to him, rushes out and said, how can I be saved? Sirs, what can I do to be saved? Because your love for me, interrupting my moment of sorrow and my woes, I wanna know the God that just set you free. I wanna know the God who just showed up in your life, who's still living and active, who still has a word and season for you, who still is pursuing you. Help me understand, who is that God? Maybe you're asking that question today. What can I do to be saved? And there's good news. Paul, he answers, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Nothing less than Jesus, nothing more than Jesus. Everything that you need is in Jesus. Your fulfillment, your satisfaction, the peace that you need to calm your anxiety, the purpose that you need to battle your depression, it's in Jesus. Not exclusive, well, it's only for Christians. No, 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 but specific. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. The only way to the Father is through Jesus. Jailer, believe in Jesus. That's how you can be saved. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Jailer became servant. Jailer became like Christ. Jailer, now being a light, washing the wounds of those he chained. testimony, a divine interruption. And at that hour of the night, the jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God and all of his household, the whole house was saved. God is interested in saving individuals, but through that individual, God is coming after generations. He's coming after your family. Maybe you've given up hope. Well, my family's too dark. My family's too far gone. You don't know the issues, the sin that's held us down. You don't know the bondage that we've been in. God wants to restore families today. Can I tell you a story? In our 21 days of prayer, really right before it started, my dad calls me, says, hey, son, you need to check on your brother. He's not doing well. He's having suicidal thoughts. You need to call him. So I call my brother, and between my dad and myself, we begin to encourage him, to challenge him, say, hey, your time's not up. Hey, there's a purpose. Hey, there's a reason why you're in this pain. God's gonna use it. There's a reason why you've experienced the interruptions that you had. God's gonna use it. Two weeks into 21 days of prayer, as we're praying and petitioning for God to reveal himself to him. He shows up to a small local church in Austin, 100 people in the room, and gives his life to Jesus. Now, he's calling me. He's like, man, I, I just got done serving in the youth ministry and, and, and this little boy came to me and, and I knew there was something he was going through and now I'm praying for him and I'm laying hands on him and, and I can't wait till we get back together. It's been 14 years since I opened my Bible, but we're gonna do a Bible study, you, me, and dad. He tells me this story. I used to wake up every morning 
with anxiety and depression. I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to go to work. I didn't want to have to face it anymore. But now I put on worship music and, and when I pray, it's like my mind doesn't even understand it, but there's peace. And I said, that's the peace that surpasses all understanding. God is meeting you right where you are. And it is next year and Sunday. So we wanna do two prayers today. The first prayer that we're gonna do is if you're a student, elementary, middle school, high school, college, this is at every campus, we would want you guys to stand up. And if you're teacher, staff, faculty in school, we'd love for you all to stand up with us. And we're gonna pray. So if you're a teacher, student, you guys can stand up. We wanna pray for you guys. Every campus. Why don't you just extend your hand to the people around you? Father, right now we just pray, Psalm 91, God, that we would rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Father, that all of these students, everyone entering this school year, God, would find refuge, strength, protection, all in you, all in your presence. We rebuke the enemy. We rebuke his plan. Whatever stalks in the night, Father, we pray right now that there would be breakthrough in every school represented, every generation in this room. We pray protection in Jesus' name. Go with them. Give them courage. Give them faith. Let them be the divine interruption in their classroom. Let them be faith-filled, praying, worshiping every door they walk through. Let them be a witness in the middle of life's interruptions that God is good. Thank you, Jesus. You guys may be seated. Amen. And with everyone's head bowed and eyes closed, maybe today God's drawing you home. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And you know it's you. You're the jailer. You're the jailer looking for a way to be saved, looking for hope again. I'd love to give you an opportunity to pray, to invite Jesus into your life, to believe in Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. Believe in him. At every campus, if that's you, no one looking around, on the count of three, I'd love for you to lift your hand so we can pray all together as a church family. One, God loves you. Two, you'll never be the same. Three, lift your hand. I see your hand, I see your hand. I see your hand, I see your hand, I see your hand, I see your hand. I see your hand, come on. Can we praise God? I see your hand. Can we praise God? All over the room. Church, say this prayer with me. Jesus, it's me. I give my sin to you. I choose in this moment to follow you. I believe in who you are. Forgive me of all my sin and Holy Spirit, fill me, walk with me, teach me to rewrite the narrative of the definition of the hand of God in my life. To see your hand, God, in everything that I'm facing. We love you. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Come on, church, can we celebrate everyone who gave their life to Jesus?